prophecy. Now, this is a matter of personal preference as to which is the greatest prophecy. But because I'm preaching, I get to tell you my preference. And my preference is this. The greatest Easter prophecy is Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to be looking at Isaiah 53 today, so you might want to look it up in your Bibles or on, on your devices. Sometimes in history, certain people distinguish themselves by accurately predicting an historical event, and they gain, and they gain uh, fame and notoriety from it. One such person was investor Michael Burry, an American who accurately predicted the collapse of the U.S. housing bubble before the 2008 financial crisis. When many other people kept investing freely, Burry was right in acting conservatively, and he managed to save millions of dollars for his investors while others lost their fortunes. Now they call him a prophet. How did he do it? Well, it wasn't miraculous. He saw the signs that were there beforehand that others just chose to ignore. One of the great proofs of the truth of Scripture is prophecy. God knows the future and at various points chooses to reveal it to us so that we might be encouraged to believe in him. God says in, in Isaiah chapter 46, I make known the end from the very beginning. All through the Bible, he used certain people to do this work for him. They were called the prophets. One of the great prophets of the Old Testament was Isaiah, a personal favorite of mine. In this beautifully written book are some of the most amazing prophecies concerning the coming of our Savior, his life, his birth, his life, his death, and resurrection. Michael Burry had the vision to see a few years in advance of the stock market trends, but Isaiah accurately and in detail predicted events concerning Jesus that would not happen for another 700 years. Now that is truly miraculous. God was revealing the future. And another thing about Isaiah, Isaiah is the prophet of salvation. More than any other prophet, he proclaimed the salvation of our God and the prophecies attached to that salvation. So Isaiah made startling prophecies concerning the, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at Christmas time, we remember the beautiful words of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Today, on this Easter Sunday, I will show you what many people believe is the greatest prophecy found in all of Scripture, Isaiah chapter 53. So first, we will look at the prophetic aspect of this passage. Then we will consider the plan of God. And lastly, the purpose of it all. Prophecy, plan, purpose. That will be our agenda. Let's turn to it. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 53. We'll actually, we'll start reading in chapter 52 and verse 12, because that's where it all begins. Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13, sorry, verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths at him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Now this is where the Song of the Servant starts. Then moving on through Isaiah 53, we get four more stanzas beyond these, each consisting of three verses. We will find that each stanza highlights an amazing prophecy concerning Christ and his death and glorious resurrection. Now, in, in chapter 52, verse 13 to 15, who are these people, these many people, who will highly exalt the Savior, who will be appalled or in mourning over him? The answer is found in verse 15, where it says that he will sprinkle many nations. He's talking about the Gentiles coming to appreciate, care for the Messiah as they hear and understand the message. Verse 15, the idea of sprinkling in scripture connotes blessing. It says kings will shut their mouths at him and wonder they will be amazed. 
You know, the, the blessing of, of uh, salvation has gone out to the Gentiles, to you and to me. And even the leaders of the Gentiles, it says kings will shut their mouths at him. In, in three centuries after Christ's death and resurrection, Constantine, the Roman Caesar or king himself, bowed the knee and became a believer in Jesus. So the prophecy is this. The prophecy is this. This Jewish servant of the Lord, this Messiah of Israel, will come to be accepted and loved and exalted by the Gentiles and their leaders. Not all, but many. Remember this prophecy was given when Israel was but a small little nation among many other larger nations, hardly noticed on the world stage. So this is an amazing prophecy. Has it come true? Of course. Today, Christianity still registers as the leading faith community of the world with over 2 billion adherents. Not all are true believers, but many are, who wholeheartedly exalt the name of Jesus. God's people are found in every country and every culture worldwide. It is wonderful to meet Christians from other nations who love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in my time in Africa, it was wonderful to meet Zambian believers who love Jesus. And they would gather in small little huts in the middle of their villages out in the bush, and they would worship the Lord Jesus Christ with all of the, ver the fervor and the zeal of, as if they were in a huge sanctuary like this one. In fact, though, you don't have to travel the world to experience this community of believers all over the world. We have our own United Nations right here in the GTA and, and in Hilltop Bible Chapel. This is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of long ago. Jesus will be a light not only to Israel, but he will be a light to the Gentiles. Let's read the next stanza, and that's chapter 53, verses 1 to 3. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Begins with the question, who has believed our report? Now, he just prophesied that the Gentile world, in chapter 2 and 15, what, would, uh, would trust in the Lord Jesus. Many of them would trust in Jesus. But what about the Jews? <clears throat> in this stanza, the writer changes the pronouns from they to us, which is in verse 13 to 15 of chapter 52, to we, like in verse uh, 2 and 3. We esteemed him not. We rejected him. We take from this that he's referring primarily to the Jewish nation. So as surely as the Gentiles eventually receive Jesus and exalt him, <clears throat> so the Jews despise him and reject him. So here's the shocking prophecy. The Jews, they, will despise and reject their own Messiah. It says they looked for some beauty or majesty in Jesus, but they found none. That is because Jesus did not come the first time to be king. They wanted a conquering Messiah who would overthrow the Romans and liberate them from their bondage and establish the, the monarchy once again. That would be majestic, but Jesus did not fit the bill. He did not meet their expectations because in his own words, he says, I came not to be ministered to as a king, but to minister and to give my life as a ransom for many. So they rejected him. John says it this way, he came to his own and his own received him not. At his trial, the Jews said, we will not have this man to rule over us. And again, we have no king but Caesar. Now, other prophecies tell us that in the end times, before Jesus returns as king, the Jews will repent and turn to Jesus and trust him as their Messiah. We see the beginnings of this already. Today, Christian groups are witnessing to Jews 
especially in Israel, and are being so successful that the Israeli parliament is, considered ban is considering banning any attempt to evangelize Jews in Israel, making it a crime punishable with a year of jail time for sharing the gospel with adults and two years of jail time if you share it with children and youth. What does that tell us? They still despise and reject their Messiah. So the prophecy is true. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Let's look at the third stanza and find another prophecy there. It says in chapter 53, verse 4 to 6, Surely he took our infirmities, carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now just look at all the words in this stanza of the song. Just look at all the words that indicate deep physical suffering. Stricken. Smitten. Afflicted. Pierced. Crushed, punished, wounded. We've already seen this in chapter 52 and verse 14. It says his, far, his form was marred beyond the, the sons of men. He was not recognizable as even as a man, let alone recognized for his own visage. He was, he, he was beyond the, the recognition as a person. He was so beaten and torn up. Every part of him, his face, his body was torn to shreds. Other prophecies in scripture indicate the suffering of our Messiah, as in Psalm 22, where it says, they pierced my hands and my feet. So Isaiah is not alone in prophesying, at prophesying the sufferings of the Christ. But the point is, it all came true. It all happened in this dark day of history when the Son of God was beaten, bruised, and nailed to the cross. Savage violence of Jewish leaders and Gentile soldiers, superheated by the wickedness of demons, was vented upon our Savior. It was a dark day indeed. You know, there's going to be another dark day coming up in just a few days. There's going to be an eclipse of the sun. And I believe that quite supernaturally, God put the sun in eclipse that day. And there was darkness over the whole land, as if all of nature was mourning in response to the suffering of the Messiah. Because there he not only endured man's, man's uh, shame and, and brutal beatings, he endured the just judgment of a righteous God upon the, 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 the uh, one who was the sin offering. As we read on, the next stanza, stanza adds yet another prophecy. It's the death of the Messiah. It says in chapter 53, verse 7 to 9, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich it is death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now look at the expressions through this text. Led to the slaughter, by oppression and judgment taken away, cut off from the land of the living, stricken, assigned a grave with the wicked, then with the rich in his death. Words could not be clearer. And the prophecy is this, the suffering of the Messiah would end in death. And this is the great prophecy of this passage. Jesus would, after all the brutality against him, die and be put in the grave. You know, the Roman soldiers were expert at assassinating people. They were experts at torture, but they were expert at, at assassinations. They knew when a person was dead. And the Roman soldier, just to affirm 
that Jesus died on the cross, put, his, put the spear through his side, and out came blood and water. That particular aspect of the testimony in John is very significant because a dead person, in a dead person, blood does not flow. Unless, of course, the heart is punctured and the lungs are punctured. And that's what the soldier managed to do with his sword and spear. There's an accumulation of fluid around the heart and lungs during great suffering. And when the soldier put the spear through the Lord's side, the blood and the water flowed. What it is, is it's a sign of he was dead. He was dead. Only the blood and water flow from a dead person when the heart is punctured. So the Lord died on the cross and his heart was broken open for you and for me. Now, in the normal course of life, we come to the end at death. That final event, death waits for us all. So how mind-blowing is this next prophecy? The Messiah is going to be raised from the dead. It says in verse uh, verse 9 to 12, 10 to 12, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to, to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord make his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. How wonderful it is to see the resurrection in these verses. Let's look at the verses. It says in verse 10, he will see his offspring. Now, this is not poetic language to describe a grief-stricken family visiting the tomb of a loved one and the dead person posthumously seeing them from the grave. No, this is a live event. He will actually see his offspring. His loved ones, his spiritual children will see him live and in the flesh. After Mary Magdalene had her encounter with the risen Lord, she exclaimed to to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And then he appeared to his disciples for the next 40 days. And at one time, he appeared to over 500, a congregation of 500 people who actually witnessed the Lord in resurrection. It says also in verse 10, he will prolong his days. That can only mean a return to life. It says that the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. This could never be said of a dead person Nobody prospers in the grave. Then it says in verse 11, he will see the light of life. In the grave, it is pitch dark. No light and no life. Not for Jesus. He will see the light of life. And then in verse 11, it says he will be satisfied. There's no satisfaction in the grave. No joy there. Only desolation. Not so with Jesus. He will have joy. Why? Because he's risen from the dead. It also says he will enter great reward in verse 12. No such blessing for dead people. Now that all speaks of resurrection. And that is exactly what happened. Isaiah predicted it and it came true. Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? So we have five great prophecies all in this one song. Number one, the Gentiles come to Christ. Number two, the Jews reject him. Number three, Jesus suffers greatly and dies and is buried. And then, boom, he is raised to life. The tomb is empty. We have a risen Savior. So prophecy is one of the great proofs of the truth of Scripture and the existence and power of an awesome, all-knowing God who wrote it. Do you doubt God today? You come this morning with doubts about your faith, whether you ever have believed at all. This message is for you. God wants you to know that he has written 
his divine book so that you might understand that from the very beginning, God knew the plan and, he, and Jesus carried it out. So we have to talk about this plan and why it, 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 the plan came to be. But because this song of the servant has more for us. Let's look at the plan. There is evidence in, in this chapter that the death and resurrection of Christ was planned not by man, but by God. Our investor, Michael Burry, prophesied the stock market collapse, but he surely didn't plan it. He didn't have that power. Big difference between foreknowing something and planning something. Did God plan the death and resurrection of Jesus? The answer is yes. It says in verse 10, it was the Lord's will to crush him. There it is. It was the Lord's will. In other words, he wrote the script. He produced the whole drama. And Jesus, far from being a helpless victim, was completely involved in the planning of it. In eternity past, God knew this would all happen. Before man sinned, before man was even created, even before the creation of the world. It says in Revelation 13 and verse 8, he was the lamb slain before the creation of the world. Words could not be clearer. In the King James Version, in the New American Standard, this statement in verse 10 is even more astounding. It says, but the Lord was pleased crush him. Pleased to crush him. How could this be? How could a loving God be pleased with the suffering of his son and, and even have planned it? Is this a loving God after all, one might ask? And yet there it is in scripture. However, lest we get the wrong answer and think our God is somehow sadistic, we must look at the broader picture to get a satisfactory answer to this dilemma. There was a plan in place for the redemption of the world, a plan agreed to by all members of the Godhead, a costly plan for the Son to die in order to rescue millions. That was in the heart of God when he gave his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was God's great love for the world. It was the Son's great love for the world that led him to give himself. I can think of some example of this planning uh, back in, in 1945 when the Western nations were planning to, to, in 1944 when the Western nations were planning D-Day to, to invade Europe and to take back the land that uh, Hitler had taken. There were men who sat in that planning room and they were planning the assault on the Normandy beaches and they knew that their own sons were going to be killed on that beach. They knew that they were putting in place a plan that was going to cost thousands of lives. And they knew that even their own children were likely going to suffer, but they made the plan anyway because of the greater good. For the greater good of us, the Lord sent his son to die on the cross. It says in verse 10 that the Lord makes his life Jesus' life, a guilt offering. Now, what was the guilt offering? It was an offering instituted by God that the Jews carried out daily in their temple. In it, a lamb was slain on the altar as a payment for the sins of the people. Instead of their death, the lamb was offered. Jesus took the position of the sacrificial lamb to pay for the sins of the world. As it says in verse 11, he was the lamb led to the slaughter. He took our place and paid the debt for our sin. Now this plan of God for Jesus to pay our sin debt is reported no less than 10 times in this chapter. 10 times, he says the same thing, different words. Look at them. Verse four, he was pierced for our transgressions. Verse four, he was crushed for our iniquities. Verse five, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Verse five, by his wounds we are healed. Verse 6, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 8, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. Verse 11, he will justify many. Verse 11, he will bear their iniquities. Verse 12, he bore the sin of many. Verse 12, he made intercession for the transgressors. It is clear from these verses that Jesus died as our substitute. 
Ten verses tell us this. The number ten is significant. It speaks of testing and trial. Jesus was tried and tested to the max, and he endured. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished, he was referring to this sin debt that was paid in full. Now forgiveness of sins is available to all who will admit their need and humbly come and trust in the Lord Jesus as their Savior. I know many in this room have already done that. We stand forgiven, not because we're good in ourselves, but because our Savior is that good, and he has done it on our behalf. Perhaps you yourself have never asked him to save you from your sins. Today can be the day when you claim for yourself the value of the work of Jesus on the cross and invite him to be your own savior. You know, we can look over these 10 references once again and put them in the first person. Make them apply to ourselves. And just as an exercise of devotion, I'm wondering if you would read these with me as they appear on the screen once again, he was pierced for my transgressions. Can we read them together? He was pierced for my transgression. He was crushed for my iniquities. The punishment that brought me peace was upon him. By his wounds, I am healed. The Lord laid on him my iniquity. For my transgression, he was stricken. He will justify me. He will bear my iniquities. He bore my sin. He made intercession for me. Now to believe this for yourself makes all the difference in life. By this you are saved. This is what saves you. When you cast yourself on the Lord, on the mercy and grace of God, and you say, Jesus is what you did for me, not anything that I could do for myself. I'm going to trust you to save me. That is the plan of forgiveness. And that leaves us with the final thought, and that is, what is the purpose of all of this? We are left to speak of the purpose of that forgiveness. Forgiveness itself is indeed wonderful, but in God's eyes, it, forgiveness and the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ was a means to a greater end, a greater purpose. And what could that purpose be? We will see the answer to that in verses 11 and 12. A company of people referred to here in association with the risen Savior, a company that by the grace and kindness of God enters into the reward of Christ's great work. And the wonder is this. Christ has forgiven us for our sins for the ultimate purpose of sharing his life and his blessing with us for all eternity. Now there are three little words, three little phrases that refer to this company of, of believers, this company of the blessed. In verse 11, it says, they are simply referred to as the many, the many, the many. One man dies, and many are brought into living relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the many. The Apostle Paul, in his book of Romans, puts it this way, if the many died by the trans trespass of the one man, that is Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? There's going to be millions of souls in heaven as a result of Jesus' work on the cross. Millions of souls. Now, I personally believe there's going to be more people in heaven than end up in hell. You say, well, how could that possibly be? Christians seem so few. But you have to understand this. In the course of time, many millions of people have already come to Christ, and I believe that during the next days of, of this world's history and the tribulation, there's going to be millions of, of people who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The, book, the tribulation is a, is a time of harvest in the midst of calamity, and the church is gone, and the Jewish people will suddenly be raised up to, to uh, be evangelists for Christ. The 144,000 are going to be praising the Lord and reaching out and, uh, with the gospel to, to the Gentiles as they were meant to do in the first place. And tens of thousands, millions of people from all of this world are going to respond in faith. And not only that, I believe Jesus has all the children. Jesus has all the children. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Jesus gets the children. Jesus gets the unborn babies. Jesus gets all of those who had such a tenuous hold on life and then their life was taken. Jesus receives 
the little children. He saves the children. And I just came in before all the adults filed in here. There was a big group of children that were in the back of the auditorium there. I thought to myself, heaven is going gonna, is gonna to have many, many rows of children who have come to Christ and, and many of them who have never known the gospel, but they're under the grace of God because of the saving power of the work of Jesus. There's going to be far more people in heaven that end up not being there. The many. Next, the, this company is identified as, as the great. It says in verse 12, I will give him, Jesus, a portion with the great. The many and now the great. Jesus deserves all glory and all reward for his work of salvation. He is the great and glorious one. But here, God says, others will share his portion of greatness. And this is the redeemed in heaven. But how are they great? I suggest to you that they are great because God has perfected their character. David says in the Psalms, Lord, thy gentleness has made me great. In what way are we great? It's because we now bear the image of the man from heaven. It says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3, we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. We began as members of a corrupt and fallen humanity. We now end up as the, as the great image bearers of God's son. We don't look much like it yet. We can, we're aware of our sins and our failures but God will transform us to be like his glorious son and our savior. Believe it, my brothers. You're going to be great. Lastly, it says in the same verse 11, it says he will divide, he will divide the spoils with the strong. The many, the great, and the strong. Now, God's redeemed people in heaven are referred to as the strong. Do you feel strong today? Probably not. But there is in every believer the strength of God because God, gives, God lives in us by his Holy Spirit. Sometimes we rely on that strength and God enables us to do wonderful things by his grace. Many times we rely on self and we fail in our weakness. But this current state of affairs of weak, strong, weak again, will end when we get to glory. There will be no more old sinful nature to make us weak, only the new. No more reliance on self, only the power of the Spirit of God flowing through us, and we will be strong forever. This is the purpose of God then, to bring many sons to glory who are great because they shine with the character of Jesus and are strong because they walk in the constant power of the Holy Spirit. And that's how we're going to spend eternity. Just as the purpose of God in creation was to populate earth with the sons of Adam, the purpose of God in salvation is to populate heaven with those who are the sons of God. They will walk the paths of glory with their Savior forever, and worship God forever. What an exalted purpose. Prophecy, plan, purpose. And it's all there in the book of Isaiah. God has said it beforehand, he revealed it in the coming of the Savior, and he's working it out in the lives of many millions of people across this world, including you and me, dear brother and sister. Do we have cause to rejoice on this Easter Sunday? Is our Lord great? Amen. And he deserves all our praise. I just want to sing at the end, we could just sing a cappella. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, O oh, glorious day. Can we sing it together? Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh, glorious day. Let's just close with a benediction. Father in heaven, we thank you for this glorious day. 
It's resurrection day, the first day of the week when Jesus rose from the dead. We say hallelujah, Christ is risen, our Lord is risen. And just as you prophesied, Lord God, beforehand through the words of Isaiah, so now it came to be, indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ died and was risen from the dead. Because he lives, we live also. We are justified because of his resurrection. We thank you, Father, that you're preparing glory for us. That we're going to be many. We're going to be great. We're going to be strong because of the, the sanctifying power of the, the, the Lord in, in our hearts. So help us to take heart today, Lord, and to walk in newness of life, to walk in resurrection power, to walk in the joy of the Lord. Because Jesus lives, we shall live also. We commend ourselves to you and pray your blessing in Jesus' name.